if you are in the management of abdominal aortic aneurysm, how do I do it and why? Dr. Saad Mahdi uh, asked me to give a teaching session the know-how of doing a proper EVAR for patients. All of you understand some of it, some of them doing it without knowing why they're doing it. However, I'm going to show you the know-how of it, and I hope this will make you understand the basis of a lot of stuff that we do. Expanding the AAA horizon, currently we're doing BVAR, SHIVARs, FIVARs, TVARs, and a lot of things being done because we started somewhere and went forward. The technology is moving so fast, and in order to excel in what you do, you have to master at least four graphs in, in your um, department, because this will cover you almost 99% of the problem. You cannot use any more than that because you don't have space to keep it on. And my advice is a lot of graphs that's not fit for the purpose and avoid them and talk to your friends and your mentors and your colleagues and they tell you which one. And some of them are very famous, but they're dangerous. Why the need for lateral thinking? 60% of treated AAA patients had anatomy that fell outside device and instruction for use. Even with more liberal interpretation of indication for use, approximately one third of patients still had anatomic configuration inconsistent with device recommendations. Proximal aortic neck lens less than 15 millimeter in more than 40% of patients, and external iliac artery less than 6 millimeter diameter in 30% of the patients. Calcific, tortuous, and narrow access vessel increase the risk for technical failure and need for secondary procedure. Moreover, we have new horizons with the technology, but the old problem didn't change at all. From severe neck angulation to conical neck structure to small access vessel to iliac femoral occlusive disease, to arterial torchosity, significant calcification or thrombus, tight aortic bifurcation, short iliac arteries, short infrarenal aorta. The rule of six, EVAR strategy made easy. Select side of the patient body where main body introduced and fixation site. And remember, all the time, try to get minimum amount of um, uh, body inside the patient. It's better to put two pieces rather than three. Put a, better put three pieces than four. The more you put connection, the, over the long term, you will have problems, that's for sure. Do not listen to anybody. The patient is yours, and he will be followed with you to the end of his life. So you have to do it the right way from the first time. Obtain a note anatomical measurement on the worksheet and always save it so that if he comes back, you know what you have done. Select main body graft with trump oversize. The minimal oversize is 25, and I do prefer 30 in the infrarenal and up to 45 into the uh, thoracic. The reason for that, we know from our MRI um, uh, 4D dynamic um, uh, measurement and segmentation, the huge change in the size of the thoracic aorta and infrarenal aorta. So the idea of uh, 10 or 15 and 20 is for the birds. You have to get a proper sizing. And the proper oversizing have to be after that. Measure outside to outside. Do not measure in to end because measure in to end is undersizing and you'll end in a disaster. Select epsilateral iliac leg with Clinton oversize and length, meaning that the maximum over there of oversizing is about 15 to 20%. That's why you have the Trump and you have the Clinton. Select the contralateral iliac leg after measuring on the table. So you have to have the three lenses. In, avoid covering the internal iliac. If you cover it, that's all right. You can't do anything about it. But always, always, when you put the lumbar twist into the iliac, it changes the configuration. And sometimes you find yourself that you might cover the internal iliac. So better before opening, measure it with the um, um, angiocast and know exactly what's going on. Protect one internal iliac if you can, patient will be happier like this. Again, rule of six, three diameters, D1, D2, and D3. And D1 is the diameter just below the rena. And D2 is the diameter of the uh, common iliac, and D3 on the left, and D3 on the right. Three important lenses. L1, 
which is the length from the lower renal to the aortic bifurcation. Because some grab, if you don't understand L1, you'll find that you're firing both limbs into the right common iliac or the left common iliac and you'll end in the disaster. L2 is very important, which is the size from the lower renal to the internal iliac bifurcation. And L3 is very important to the right and the left. Use axial CT images to measure the outer wall to outer wall proximal neck and common iliac diameter from the outer wall to outer wall. Again, the rule of six. Use axial CT images to measure external iliac diameter from inner wall to inner wall to ensure that the introduction system can access the vessel. The vessel must be compatible with the introduction system that have the profile of 12 to 15 sheaths which is between 4.7 and 6.5 millimeter out of the anterior sheath. Use angiography with calibrated caster to determine the length of the leg of the graft needed. Do not oversize the length. Oversize the diameter, no problem. Oversizing the length will end in problem. Use the actual length and it's great if you use it intraoperatively. If necessary, select a shorter leg graft if it's required. Step one, choose the size that has the best access vessel for the main body. This is, could be gone through when you understand iliac trochosity and vessel diameter, angulation of a distal neck, aneurysmal sac orientation, presence of a mural thrombus within the aneurysm, symptoms of ileo femoral disease, stenosis of calcification, iliac lens, a short iliac on the contralateral side or iliac aneurysm on the epsilateral side. Step two, D1, get the large aortic neck diameter throughout the 15 millimeter neck length. D2, the large iliac diameter through the contralateral distal fixation site. D3, the large iliac diameter through the ipsilateral distal fixation site. Then the L1, L2, L3, the length between the lower renal and the aortic bifurcation, including the lateral deviation, which is very important. The length between the lower renal and the contralateral distal fixation site, including the lateral deviation and the rest between the lower renal artery and the epsilateral distal fixation site, including the lateral deviation. Secret of an EVAR success. Proximal aneurysm neck is considered the Achilles heel of EVAR failure. Length, diameter, and angulation are most important morphological feature of the proximal aneurysm neck. More hostile aneurysm neck are related to adverse EVAR outcome. Introduction of the newer synth graph with increasing experience Patients with shorter, more severely angulating neck and wider aneurysm neck are considered eligible for EVAR. The aortic neck. Very important to understand that I'm giving you the know-how. The aneurysm neck should be investigated for its shape, length, and diameter, as well as for the presence of thrombus calcification and bulging. Measuring the aneurysm neck length on a reconstructed view along the Line, one should realize that the length of a virtually stretched aneurysm neck is being measured. The actual aneurysm neck length is most likely not equal to the functional neck length in patients with angulating necks. You tell that I have stretched the view, I have two centimeter neck. You put the graft in, you can't find even a neck. That's why don't get deceived by an enthusiastic reg or residue who's trying to tell you to do it something that cannot be done. You have to do everything yourself. Trust nobody except yourself. The functional neck is the length of the neck that can be adequately used for fixation and sealing of the stent graft. You'll find people, oh, you can do this. There is this, this. Remember, the drug rep or the clinical specialist, some people wants to sell graft. So they try to tell you use it, which you can't use it. Some inexperienced people who are using the, um, the uh, workstation will tell you something that does not exist. So always look at yourself, and you have to understand that you are the one who's carrying the can. Angulation in aneurysm neck hampers the effect and the effort to use the entire neck for stent, graft fixation, and sealing. Now, the other thing that is the increasing function landing zone is to through uh, canceling the parallax. And in order to cancel the parallax, you cannot put the uh, C-arm or your end suite into an AP, you have to have what's called craniocaudal in order to cancel the parallax so that you could increase your functioning landing zone. Increasing the function landing zone is the success of your EVAR. Functional aneurysm neck. First, the radial force of EVAR can only be used for sealing and fixation if it's pressed appropriately to the aortic wall. 
Do not say that I've done the over uh, sizing as Prof said, but it didn't work because you did not see the function aneurysmic. You fired it in the middle of the aneurysm. In a more angulated neck, the length of the stent graft alignment to the aneurysm neck will be shorter than in a straight aneurysm neck. Second, the greater the curvature of a tube, the greater the change in the blood flow velocity that circulate in this tube. The force applied against the wall by the flight flow is proportional to the square of the change in the velocity in angulated neck, thus resulting in an increased displacement force. So if you have the neck like this, you need to correct it first. That's why you do the dress technique. We put a giant fan mask to collect it so that we prevent displacement later on. Finally, appropriate position, sealing, and fixation are all the more important in patients with an angulated aneurysm neck because angulated aneurysm necks are related to adverse anatomical characteristics. Here we are. Asymmetric deployment and undersizing of VAR have serious consequences. You can see here that you have put a smaller uh, stent ended in a bigger endoleak. It's crazy or total migration. So you have to do everything by the book in order to have a better outcome. Endocilting. Endocilting is the uh, ability to allow both areas to be at the same level to get together so that you don't have an area bigger or smaller. You could do that through the radius and diameter of a plan not perpendicular to a water increases the more oblique it's placed to the perpendicular plan, influence the degree of oversizing. So that when you go it, you just push while you're firing in order to allow it to come closure. In fact, for furnace, Gore is the only one who allow you to do uh, indicating by twisting it. You have to pull the lambda twist inside it so that there's no more um, uh, super stiff. And then the neck will sit nicely, whether in the TVAR or into the EVAR. Trump your EVAR sizing in angulating neck. Imagine a patient with an aneurysm neck of 25 millimeters, so the circumference is 78. A symmetrical play stent with a diameter of 30 would fit perfectly in this aneurysm neck, 20% oversizing. If this stent graph isn't placed symmetrically, but at an angle of 20 degrees to the aneurysm neck, the oversizing will be less than the area that has to be covered by the stent graph, will be electrically shaped, and more aortic wall will have to be covered. So that's why if you do only 20%, you'll have higher entrance of type 1 endoly. In this situation, the circumference of the EPS will be 81, which corresponds to a circle with diameter of 25, and the oversized will be 16 instead of 20, and that's why you have the problem. If the stent is split at angle of 40 to the annulus neck, which is not uncommon severely angled neck, then the circumference of the epileps of the neck increased to 92. This resembles a circle with diameter of approximately 29, circumference of 92. In this situation, it's 10 graphs of 30 is only oversized 2.4. We believe the 10 graph should be oversized above 20 by at least 5 to 10. That's why I was telling you 30% oversizing is the best way forward. The dress technique, I've spoken about that in the previous talk. The an inner and outer coverage exists in an angulated aneurysm neck, with the shorter inner coverage is the limit of the functional neck. A stain graph can only use the entire length of the neck for fixation and sealing if the aneurysm neck is straightened. Peri-procedure straightening of an aneurysm neck increases the functional neck. The length of an aneurysm neck is the most important anatomic factor determining the straightening possibility during the procedure. A guide wire in a long aneurysm neck is forced to follow the track of the aneurysm neck and take the inner outer curvature route. In short aneurysm neck, the guide wire will take the inner, inner curvature route, which is almost straight. Therefore, the longer the angulated aneurysm neck, the more it can be straightened during the procedure. Calcification of the aneurysm neck, the length of the neck, the presence and morphology of lumbar artery in the AAA neck, and angle between the neck and the common iliac artery all determine the possibility of straightening the aneurysm. Tricks of the dress technique. Again, dress technique is design, reconfigure, or engage, straighten, and stiffen. If asymmetric stand graph placement is considered, a possibility you must have several stand graph sizes available during the endovascular procedure. The degree of sizing of the stand graph can be adapted to the straightening of the aneurysm neck, the asymmetric position of the guide wire, and the access site of the main device is crucial for your success. 
A straightening of an angulating angle's neck is achieved by the introduction of a few very stiff guide wires. Here we are, the central human line lens indicates the true length of the triple neck, but will not be functional neck. So what you need in order to get a functional neck is to straighten everything first through dress technique, so you could increase the functional neck from 12 in here to 23 in here. To prevent asymmetric deployment, a second, third, and fourth stiff guard is introduced for the delivery of the stand graph. If the stand graph is used over the second guard wire is in an optimal place for deployment, the guide wire over which the stand graph is used can be replaced by a less stiffer wire. This results in a more symmetric placement of the stand graph. One should note that changing the guide wire is not allowed in all stands according to the instruction of use. So this is our experience over the past um, uh, until 2016. And this is a patient common with a grade zero SVS cord. Despite that, you can say, oh my God, look at this patient. He has severe angulation. In fact, by definition, this is zero to one SV, S, um, SVS scoring system. And early accessing six to seven maximum diameter. Best for this patient is an in-craft go directly. Another patient comes in here to here with a, 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 a early accessing calcified in the pavement is required. And again, grade zero to one. You're going to say, oh God, he has extensive calcification. Believe it or not, by the reporting standard, this is straightforward evolved. When you come in here, you could see yourself that we open it exactly what it's supposed to do, and there's no jumping and there's no covering. And this is where we have done the same patient using the ink craft, and you can see the completion angiogram, and you can see the eye sign where there is no dye between the two limbs in here, meaning that there's no endo leak. Again, this is the patient who comes to us with extensive disease, and we have done the endovascular solution for it, and you can see again. The eye sign, no endo leak. This is the follow up over five years, and there's no migration. So, the reason to, to be sure that you're firing the right way and getting the proper designation is that over a long time, there's no migration from the level of the renal. Difficult access, this is grade two to three. This is patient, have a, a almost total occlusion in here. And what we have went through, we went through a uh, control lateral, we use a, a rim caster, and we went done a rendezvous technique in order to cross the wire. And then after doing that, we went on and we found our graft, and this is the follow-up. So we had endopaving uncoupled, and we put an ink graft in this um, um, uh, almost totally included iliac system and our iliac occlusive disease, and the patient done fantastically well. Again, this is a patient who require endopaving and coupling with a total occlusion, and we went on and we put after that along a smart 12 by 8 into the external elect in order to get a, a very good outcome. Another patient with severe aortic elect occlusive disease, we with a small abdominal aortic aneurysm 4.5. So in order to treat everything, we put a, a, an ink craft and we went up to the external elect in order to do this case, and this is the completion angiogram show exactly how it's marvelously locked after post endo paving and coupling. The octopus AAA, that's great still two and three by the SVS scoring system. That's why they can say, oh God, I've done an octopus. I'm just telling you, you see that you have done a great job. You see how far is, is the grade is two to three. And this is the octopus AAA we've done him and the patient looks fantastically well. Um, and the follow up um, uh, after a few years, uh, there's no problem. Challenging neck, Still, believe it or not, grade two and three. So this is an angulated neck, not suitable, and they tell you they cannot do it. So we could do it because we have done and we know how to oversize and how to treat this by increasing the functional landing zone. Without increasing the functional landing zone, you will end up prior type one endoleak. And you will say that, why this guy doesn't have an endoleak and I have endoleak? Because you do not increase your functional landing area. Again, this is the iliac um, uh, 90 degrees. What we usually do, we do um, a stent at the end of the iliac in order to prevent uh, this problem. Double 90% um, um, iliac access and 90% uh, angulated neck. We go in and we do a, a dress technique where we put uh, palmas, giant palmas over there and then hook the uh, stent on it. And it looks fantastic after that. 
So the whole idea that you have to have everything in your hand in order to allow things to be done perfectly well, as you can see in here from these two very complex cases. Again, rest technique could be used in the rupture aneurysm, and this is the rupture over there. We put a, a giant XL in here, and you can see the completion angiogram in here, and the patient was saved from his rupture. This is a patient coming in again with a major problem that he had a contained rupture, and we're using a low profile percutaneous system. Nobody believed 10 years ago that rupture analysis could be done percutaneously. Now it is the norm. Now, grade uh, 4E, which is the emergency one for ruptures. And as you can see, this is the patient comes in here uh, with a rupture. We put the um, pal giant palma stent in here. We put the graft in, and this is the rupture. And here you can see the ruptures freely over there. And that's the completion angiogram. You can see because a huge sac, how the limbs were just flying across the two areas. Again, this is we do the um, um, CT enter optum to be sure that everything has gone well. However, we started um, uh, doing this and then we abandoned it because it's cumbersome. However, with the new uh, GE uh, machine that uh, we're going to have, I think this will be the routine for all of our patients. A revar by lateral common iliac, again, straightforward, you come in, you cover to the extended iliac, and there'll be no embolization to any of the internal iliac. Forget about it, you're saving the patient life. And this is the way it's supposed to be done. Now, revar for aortic cava fistula. So this is a patient came in with a rupture, aortic aneurysm into his inferior vena cava up there, to which we have put a C tag, and here short C tag, and this is the evar in it, and he done fantastically well. And then another patient come in with a um, extensive rupture. So we have a DU um, uh, revar, one um, into the inferior vena cava and one in the aortic iliac, and he's 10 years post-operatively, and he's doing fantastically well. Aortic dissection, so this is a patient in February 2008, came with the right common iliac artery aneurysm. We decided to do an endovascular, we put a cook after we have reverted, done a CT scan, everything looked hungry, gory, and then she decided to go for a DC shock. Because the right um, uh, common iliac is fixed, uh, she came in with um, a, an infernal acute aortic dissection. You can see that the whole infernal aorta is dissected into three parts, with severe abdominal pain not responding to anything. So we decided to treat her with endovascular scissoring, um, um, where you put two wires and, and slash the, uh, the septum. And then after that, we use the ink craft in it. And you can see in here, this is in the pulse lumen, and this is where it went through the true lumen, and just putting the stem. And this is the completion angiogram, almost um, last year, which is almost um, about six years, and the aneurysm totally, uh, totally disappeared. Both internal iliac are gone because we have to fix the dissection and things look hunky dory. Now, more cases, and the more we do, the more we learn the tricks. The whole idea is to do a proper sizing, increase your functional capacity, seal the iliacs, and if you don't cannot seal the iliacs, we are avoiding putting any stent more than 23 in the iliacs. If more than 23, we use a branch device to the internal iliac, or we cover it and go to the external iliac. Putting anything above 23 in the iliacs is an invitation for further problems. The stiffness of the guide wire, delivery system, and endograms themselves can alter the anatomic configuration of the aorta and iliac artery. Post-deployment curvilinear paths that an endogram ultimate takes can be difficult to estimate from pre-operative or even interoperative pre-deployment imaging studies. Asymmetric position of VVAR can lead to intermittent proximal type 1 endoleak or migration. This is overcome by the deployment of a stent graft with suprarenal fixation. Suprarenal fixation diminishes the problem of asymmetric fixation because the angle between the suprarenal and infrarenal aorta is usually smaller than the angle between the infrarenal aorta and the tuplasia. Appropriate oversizing stent graft in patients with angulating annulus neck is crucial, up to 40%, in order to expand your practice safely. Proper planning and sizing will increase applicability over the broad spectrum of aortic iliac anatomic configuration. Persistence of low rate of secondary procedure and aneurysm related morbidity will provide a minimally invasive solution that compares favorably with traditional open surgical aneurysm fare over the long run. I thank all of you for
sitting to the end to understand what we're trying to explain and teach you.